When analyzing frames, one of the questions we ask is given some applied load, is the structure capable of supporting this applied load? We will learn how to answer this question for three force members later in the course, but for now let's focus on answering this question for two force members. There are two factors that come into play when answering this question. First is the material properties of the material of the structure, and second are the geometry of the structure. Using our equilibrium analysis, we can find the force in two force members. In order to understand this force, we must convert the force into a stress, which relates the force in the member to the size of this member. Stress is the force per unit area. For members that are loaded axially, such as straight two force members, the stress in the member is the applied force divided by the cross-sectional area of the member. An assumption for this is that the force is uniformly distributed throughout the cross-section. Here you can see an applied force at the end and a uniform distributed force if we were to take a cut through the cross-section. When the forces are pulling the member apart, the member is said to be in tension. When the forces are squishing the member, the member is said to be in compression. Since stress is a force over area, the units are typically newtons over meters squared, which is a pascal, or pounds over inches squared, which is PSI. In Engineering 270, Material Science, you will learn more on how material properties are determined. But here's a quick intro into the topic. Typically, material properties are determined by testing or loading standard size specimens uniaxially in tension with a tensile testing machine. This machine is capable of measuring the force with a load cell. The tensile testing machine measures the force as the specimen is stretched to failure. The displacement is measured with an extensometer and the force is measured with a load cell. A computer gathers this data and the stress is plotted versus the strain. Strain is the displacement that is normalized to the initial length of the specimen. A typical material response can be seen on this stress versus strain plot, where the strain is plotted on the x-axis and the stress is plotted on the y. Typically, the stress will increase linearly as the material is strained or stretched. This initial portion is called the elastic range. If a material is unloaded, it will go back to the origin and have no residual strain. However, at some point, the material will yield. And as the material stretches, it is no longer behaving linearly. If the material is unloaded at this point, it will have some permanent deformation. It's called plastic deformation. Continuing the load path, material reaches an ultimate load at which point, as the material stretch more, the load starts to decrease until finally failure. Some critical points on this plot for determining material properties are the yield point and the ultimate load. The stress at the yield point is called sigma yield, or the yield stress. The stress at the ultimate load is called the ultimate stress. Typically, when designing materials, they are designed for loads that will cause stresses below the yield stress because once the material yields, it will be plastically deformed and therefore will not retain its initial geometry. The material properties found from the stress strain plot can be looked up to, and are consistent for materials. One book that is common for looking up these material properties is the Standard Handbook for Mechanical Engineers. There are other resources online that are good for finding these material properties. Here we have highlighted the material properties for steel. You can see the yield strength is around 80,000 PSI, which is referred to 80 KSI, and the tensile strength uh, when quenched and drawn is around 100,000 PSI, or 100 KSI. The important one is the yield strength. An important metric for understanding if a structure will fail under a given load is the structure's safety factor. 
safety factor can be calculated simply as the ratio of the load capacity over the applied load. For example, if we have a two force member with a 100 pound force and a, a cross-sectional area of 0.25 inches squared, we can find the stress and tension of this member is equal to 100 pounds over 0.25 inches squared. This is 400 psi. Therefore, the safety factor, if we have SAE steel 1300 annealed of, remember this is the units here is KSI, we have 40 KSI divided by 0.4 KSI, giving us a safety factor of 100. If a safety factor is greater than 1, the material should not fail. If a safety factor is less than 1, then the material is liable to fail. Since this safety factor is much, much greater than 1, this is a very safe load to apply on this structure. An important concept when considering machines is mechanical advantage. The mechanical advantage of a machine is the ratio of the output force to the input force. Let's see how this is put in action with a simple machine of using a lever arm to lift a stone. How much force would the man have to apply to lift the stone? Applying equilibrium analysis, we can take a moment about A to determine this. Taking the moments about A, we find that it is L1 times F in minus L2 times F out is equal to zero. Solving for F out over F in, or the mechanical advantage, we find that it is equal to L1 over L2. It is advantageous to put yourself at a high mechanical advantage, therefore you have a high output force for a small input force. This suggests that L1 should be increased while L2 should be decreased to increase the mechanical advantage of this lever. In this problem, we're asked to determine the mechanical advantage of the pliers. Since the pliers transmit the force input from the hands to a force at the bolt, this is called a machine. Let's use a similar method of analysis to the frame to analyze this machine. First, let me label the diagram with all the relevant points. A, B, C, D, and E. Removing the bolt from the system and taking the entire pliers of the system, remove the bolt with a normal contact at the point of contact between the bolt and the plier. I have made the assumption that this is a frictionless contact. Other assumptions that I've made in my free body diagram that this is a massless plier, 2D, rigid body in equilibrium, and there are frictionless pins A, B, C, D, and E. From this free body diagram, we can see that there are infinite solutions. As long as F bolt 1 is equal and opposite to F bolt 2, it will be a satisfactory solution for this free body diagram. So we cannot find the specific value from the force of the bolt with this free body diagram alone. We will have to take the system apart similar to a frame analysis. To do this, I will draw a free body diagram in system 1 of the head of the pliers, removing the two force member from A to D. And for our second system, I will choose the handles of the pliers and remove the bottom half of the plier. Note that I've been consistent in this free body diagram when pulling apart pin B. In system 1, I have drawn the forces at B in the negative direction. So in system 2, I have drawn the forces both going in the positive direction. In this system, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 unknown. So we will not need any additional free body diagram. Normally I would start by analyzing S2 since it has the only known force in it. However, let's start with S1. By taking the sum of the forces in the x direction in S1, since Fbx is the only force, we find that Fbx is equal to zero. This is crucial because it makes our analysis of S2 simpler. Next, in S2, let's take the sum of the moments about C. In S2, we'd like to find the forces at B, since those show up in S1. Therefore, we don't need to find the forces at C. So let's take a moment at C to find the forces at B. Both FBY and P will cause a moment about C. Here we can see why it was crucial to solve for FBX, since there is some unknown 
y displacement between b and c, but this was not given geometry. Since fbx is zero, we do not have to account for the moment of fbx about c. Solving for fby, we find that it's equal to minus 6p. So the direction we have chosen to draw it is opposite in the direction it really is. Moving on to system one, let's take a moment about a to find the force at the bolt. Note in this moment equation, I have chosen to keep the direction of fby as drawn in my free body diagram. And later I'll plug in the minus sign when plugging in the force for fby. In this case, since fby is pointing down and to the right of a, using the right hand rule, it will cause a negative moment. Solving for f bolt, we find that it is minus three times fby. However, plugging in that fby has been drawn in the opposite direction in both S2 and S1, we plug in minus six for fby. This gives us that the force of the bolt is 18 times P. We find that the mechanical advantage of the plier is equal to 18 P over the force in of P, which tells us that the force felt by the bolt will be 18 times greater than the force applied by our hand.